Gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So, so grateful and thankful for the truth of your word, for the gospel by which we are saved the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who redeemed us apart from anything that we could ever do. We just give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Filter out all that which is foolish, seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying parables. Uh, we have made a decision, though, to... Uh, delay that just for this video. Uh, we're going to get on a, a regular schedule, at least I hope to, uh, of going through a, a new verse-by-verse -verse study through 2 Corinthians on Sunday and Parables Wednesday night. So that's the, uh, that's the plan. I welcome you all uh, uh, to these verse-by-verse -verse studies. Uh, we've really uh, enjoyed going through scripture verse by verse uh, if the lord tarries uh, this channel may have uh, completed a an entire new testament verse by verse uh, playlist i want to talk about something that's been on my heart lately uh, I, I do videos like this from time to time i want to talk about the gospel uh, I just think the timing is is good on that. Um, there is some interest. I, I get questions from time to time about certain aspects of concerning our redemption uh, and just where we stand in the plan of God in this uh, uh, this present dispensation of grace in which we live. So Sunday morning, Second Corinthians, verse by verse, Wednesday night parables. Uh, before we begin along that path, though, I'd like to talk about 2 Peter 2.1. 2 Galatians, what we read there in Galatians is, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which, was not, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Without the chapter division, we know that God's prophets who wrote years ago were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't their word, their thinking, it wasn't their reasoning, it wasn't their logic, but it was the word of God. But there were false prophets then, and there will be false teachers now, uh, in us or among us, the word there is epsilon nu, it's the word is in, but it can be translated both ways. Clearly, the false prophets in the Old Testament were in the majority, and it seems clearly evident today that the false teachers are in the majority. We are, in fact, to evaluate whatever is being taught by the Word of God. It must be based upon the Word of God. There are innumerable counterfeits, but the fact that these counterfeits exist is simply testimony to the existence of the truth. And so it is, it, it's, it's on us to to be faithful with the Word of God that we might recognize false teaching. In the epistle to the Galatians, we're told that do I yet please men? If I please men, I would not be the servant of Christ. It's a sobering thought. First of all, the context in Galatians chapter 1 is that there are false gospels and there are many false gospels. The language is very serious. If anyone preach any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. That's strong language. And yet we're so loving 
and we're so understanding that we put up with trash all the time. And yet we are encouraged, in fact, we are commanded to rebuke and to exhort with all authority. There's a lot of false teaching. One of the characteristics of that teaching is that it pleases men. That is characteristic of the false teacher. So we arrive at this verse, and we've got a lot of studying in this verse. If, if we're going to be fair with the text and, and do the text justice, it is astounding, folks, what most commentaries do with 2 Peter 2.1. So the content of this message will, that I'm giving now will deal with 2 Peter 2, 1 through 8. And I chose this passage because this is the battleground. The major uh, theater of the conflict between the flesh and the spirit today. And so I want to look at, at many of these concepts in this verse and at least ask you to think about it. There is false teaching without any question. It, it exists and you understand it and you know it by comparing it with Scripture. And now we're told that they're going to bring in damnable heresies so the subject really of this video is heresy. You know, and, and how in the world is anybody going to cover all of the heresies that's taught? Well, we can't do that. I don't intend to do that. I don't intend to try to do that. I am going to look at one which I call heresy. And every time I do that, people are shocked. You know, I'm, I'm unloving. I'm unkind. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm glad that your responsibility is not to listen to me and believe what I say, but to examine the Scriptures daily carefully to see whether or not these things be so. There is something wonderful about gathering together. We do this on Facebook. We do this here. We do this in our churches. Uh, I, I know that there are people sitting out there uh, that, that know more than I do. It's amazing what we do with the Scriptures. God says, let him that is taught in the Word communicate with him that teaches. So criticize all you want, whatever it takes, so that both of us are in conformity with this book. I don't know how to put it in, in words any stronger. I don't expect to live much longer. Please, people, I urge you, this is God's Word. It's the Word of the Sovereign God and no privilege that you have ever known is equal to the privilege of just holding this book in your hands and feasting upon it. Dearly beloved, why can't we just take God at His word? Damnable heresies. Now, there are translations which say that heresies are that which sends you to hell. I don't think that's the right way to handle the word. It's a word that means destroy or ruin heresies that ruin the Christian life. And they, and they can. Romans 14, we saw that when we went through Romans. Destroy not with thy meat thy brother for whom Christ died. And, and I sincerely hope that you don't think that that passage says that you can send your brother to hell for whom Christ died. That's not what the word means but you can ruin his life. You can teach him 
to rely on his flesh, to rely on works, to rely on baptism, to rely on whatever, and ruin his Christian life and his Christian experience. What you cannot do is pluck him out of the Father's hands. Now, if we're going to talk about heresy, I think the concept of free will is heresy. You don't have to agree with that, but let's just think about it. Everybody knows that they have free will. That's the most common thought. But what does free mean? And I, now, and I admit I may be wasting your time, but I read God chose who my father was. God chose who my mother was. God chose my nationality. God chose a nation. God chose the decade that I was born, and God chose a mountain of other things. But by golly, come hell or high water, I, I, ch I chose whether to have French fries or onion rings, so I, so I must be able to choose God, right? What does free mean? Does free mean that I can choose anything? I can, that I can will to do anything? Well, of course not. First of all, my ability to choose is limited by my ability. As a kid, I tried desperately to flap my arms and fly. It didn't work. It can't work. My, my dad, he tried to drill into me, you know, can't is not in your vocabulary, Steve. You can do anything that you set your mind to doing. I said, Dad, I can't swim the Atlantic Ocean. You know, can't swim the Pacific Ocean. Can't fly to the moon. You know, what do you mean that it's not in my vocabulary. It seems to me like most of my vocabulary is can't. You know, the things I can't do, I, I don't have the ability to do them. So my freedom, dearly beloved, is limited by my ability. Well, of course, when people speak of free will, they don't mean that kind of freedom. So we're using the word free, you know, sort of, sort of loosely. You know, which is what Christians do. They're very loose with language. What we mean by free will, says the Christian, is that you're free, you are free, a free will moral agent. Okay? There are a lot of things that you're not free to do. You're limited by your intelligence. You're limited by your physical ability. You're limited by your birth. All of those. You know, we understand that. But the God who decided who your father was and the God who decided who your mother was and the God who decided when you were born, left it up to you to decide whether you go to heaven or hell? What kind of God is that? So you're a free will, moral agent. God will draw all men, but, but you have the freedom to resist that drawing. Let me tell you something. Grace is irresistible. Well, am I a free will moral agent? Well, John 6, 44, No man can come to me except the Father which is in heaven forces him. Helkuo, okay, means to force. John 6, 63, It's the spirit that quickens the flesh profits nothing. Are you saying that the flesh can choose God? I mean, that sounds profitable to me. You know, the flesh profits nothing. It's the Spirit that gives life. John 6, 65, No man can come unto me except it's given to him by the Father. 
They can't decide to do it. Where's the free will in that? John 8, 43, why don't you understand my speech? Because you cannot hear my word. John 8, 47, he that is of God hears, so you don't become of God by hearing. You hear because you're of God. You therefore do not hear because you are not of God. How could, how could the text be any clearer? Where is free will in that? John 10, 26. You don't believe because you're not my sheep. How clear, folks, do you... Do you, do you want God to make it? And this Sunday, there'll be 100,000 sermons preached that, um, that you can become His sheep if you'll accept Him, if you'll just believe, if you'll just repent, if you'll just be baptized, and I don't know what all else. Whereas the very Bible that they're preaching from says, if you are not His sheep, you can't believe. And you can't take those words to say, if you believe, you'll become His sheep. You can't turn that around. The words don't say that. The Scriptures clearly say that belief is based upon being a sheep. Being a sheep is not based upon belief. Romans 8, 7 and 8. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It isn't subject to the law of God. Indeed, it cannot be subject to the law of God. It cannot be subject. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Dearly beloved, everybody's Bible says that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God they are foolishness to him. And someone says, well, I understand that, but there's one exception to that verse. And that's a person who repents and believes. Well, I, I, I look for that. My Bible doesn't have that exception in there. So you just insert something that isn't there well, Steve, uh, it's, it's certainly taught elsewhere. Sorry, I don't see it. What I see is God chose everybody I ever heard or read about and used them in the way that He saw fit. But Steve, 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 that just isn't fair. What isn't fair? It's free will that isn't fair because, folks, if, if it were based on man's freedom to choose one way or another, then the, in, the entire structure of Christianity itself would collapse in on itself. Because the heresy of free will destroys grace. The best-selling book on the planet does not teach grace and free will coexist side by side, that they somehow work in cooperation with one another, in harmony with one another. doesn't say that. It says they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You know, do you think that it would please God to accept Christ as your personal Savior? I, I think He'd be ecstatic. In fact, I think He'd be amazed because, in, you know, because, well, because it can't be done. They that are in the flesh cannot. They have no ability, no ability, says the text, to please God. Romans 9, 16, it is not of him who wills, who decides, or of him that runs, that is, that tries, but of God who shows mercy. Text couldn't be any more clear. 
So personal decision or personal attempts have nothing to do with it. It is God who chose to have a family who decides one way or the other. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. He cannot know them. So for you to say that he has, a, he has a will so that he can choose to know them is contrary to the Word of God. And it, that is heresy. That is heresy. What does the word will mean? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means desire. So, are, are your desires free? Are your desires free? No. No, your desires are not free. You know it, and I know it. Every desire in you has been put there by something. It's been put there by something. Uh, hereditary, training, maybe God, but dearly beloved, it is not free. You do not have the freedom to desire God. And now we look at the word saved. Saved. I've talked a lot about this. Unbelievable what we do with the word sozo, saved. Saved means born again. It, do, it doesn't. If saved means, means born again, then my being born again is nearer than when I first believed. Okay? You got to be kidding. My justification is nearer than when I first believed. Now, my regeneration is nearer than when I first believed. Folks, none of those make any sense. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That is what's nearer than when I first believed. And I eagerly look forward to that. Salvation means deliverance, rescue. It doesn't mean born again. In 1 Peter 1, God in His abundant mercy caused us to be born again. Where's any free will in that? Well, there isn't any. 1 Peter 1, 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but by incorruptible, by the Word of God. By the Word of God. Were you born again by believing? No. You were born again by the Word of God. Why can't we just take God at, God's Word at face value? To even suggest that you could be born again by accepting or believing or anything else is heresy. And I don't know, folks, what other word to use. What it does is transfer the merit from Christ to you. The minute that you suggest that you are born again, regenerated, justified, made righteous, reconciled to God by something that you do, you've taken, removed the glory from God and you've put it on you. That's heresy. That is heresy. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. We weren't redeemed by believing. We were not redeemed by anything else. We were redeemed by Christ. By Christ. In Romans 5, it was when you were enemies that we were reconciled to God. When, you were in, when we were enemies. By, and that by the death of His Son. By the death of His Son, not believing. You have to face whether or not everybody in the world was reconciled. I don't believe they were. But we were reconciled to God by the death or through the death of His Son. That's how we were reconciled. We were not reconciled by believing. We were justified freely by His grace, not by believing. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Look at the context. Look at the context. And you'll see that it's Christ's faithfulness 
that's being talked about. It's Christ's obedience that's being emphasized. It has to be the faith of Jesus Christ, not your faith in Christ. The only reason that translation is there is, the, is because of the personal prejudice of the translator because the context, without argument, argues for the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Just look at it. Verse 3 of the same chapter. Why isn't that faith in God there? Well, it's the same grammatical construction. Why was it faith in Jesus Christ, but this isn't faith in, uh, in God? Why did they translate the genitive that way there and not in verse 22? I don't know. <laughs> there are lots of those. And, th and then we ought to look at the word faith. Romans 3.22 even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. We hardly ever look at that. The reason that you're redeemed is not by your faith in Christ. It's the faithfulness of Christ. He died in your place. He reconciled you. He gets all the glory. Man wants the glory. That's the offense of the cross. That's a lie. And that's heresy. I'm certain that most of you have heard the normal heresy. Yeah, well, if you'll just recognize that you're a sinner, and if you'll just recognize that you, if you will just recognize that you, that you need a Savior, and if you will and that Jesus Christ is that Savior, and if you will accept Him as your personal Savior, then maybe, pretty sure He will, but, you know, well, He'll wash away your sins. Folks, what's He going to do? Redie? Come and die again? Die again? It already says that He gave Himself for you when Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was when He died on the cross that your sins were were there, all of them. He's not going to die again because you accepted Him. You've made forgiveness conditional. We've got faith of God in verse 3, righteousness of God in verse 5, the way of peace in verse 17, the fear of God in verse 18. All of these genitives for all you Greek students out there, are translated like they would normally be translated, but in verse 22, most of the modern translations, they rip the genitive apart and they separate it from the context. And that's the problem. A brother of ours named Wallace, he's one of the great Greek scholars, da Daniel Wallace. He's a professor of New Testament studies at, at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's also the founder and the executive director of the Center for the uh, Study of New Testament Manuscripts. Very smart guy. His main interest uh, is, has always been New Testament uh, Authentication, early Christian writings, uh, the Koine Greek grammar. He says that every place a genitive occurs, it ought to be translated the faithfulness of Christ. And I agree. It's His faithful work. Now the modern evangelist tells you that faith is not a work. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Faith's not a work, you know. But he still has to say, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that of not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So, well, so, so it, it can't be of works. Oh, but the Bible says it is. The Bible says it is. Believe me, folks, the Bible says it is of works. John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I finished I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So you can tell that modern evangelist the work was Christ's faithfulness. 
Because that's what the text says. Apparently, his faithfulness was work. Acts 13, 41, Behold ye despisers, and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And most of them don't. Christ worked that work. Romans 9, 28, For He will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work because a short work will the Lord because of a short work will the Lord make upon the earth God did that God did that in fact Philippians 3:22 says that the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering faith faith therefore our, our faith is a work of the spirit Ephesians 2 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He made us alive because we were dead in trespasses and sins. It was when we were dead in trespasses and sins that he made us alive. No dead person can believe. No dead person can receive. No dead person can accept. No dead person can do anything. Ephesians 2.10, we were born again by the will of God. We are now alive because He made us alive. And He delivered us by His grace from our former way of life. Not of works, because we are His workmanship. That's, that's singular there in the Greek. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's where we were. You didn't exist before that. Your real life didn't exist before God gave you a new man, made you a new creation in Christ. Whose works? His. Not, not yours. Not mine. That we should walk in them, says the text. That's what we walk in. And I think that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful. We believe because we're His sheep. Free will is another gospel. It is heresy. It is the gospel of the Roman Catholic Church. And it's amazing that people argue about being Protestants. And, 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 and yet, most of the Protestant gospel taught today is, is jives very closely with Rome. The, the, the church has become thoroughly Galatianized. It's blind, and therefore it can't even recognize that it's the problem. Our Lord knew. He knew that that was the problem when He confronted the Pharisees of His time. Saved by works, saved by something man does, saved by, saved by the will of the flesh, saved by baptism. Look, let, let me close with, with this. Blessed Hope Forever is not a church of Rome. It is a tiny, insignificant, almost practically unrecognized little ministry that, that believes that God ordained a finished work in Jesus Christ and that He brought it to pass. That Those are the works we walk in. We're not born again because we believe. We believe because we're born again. I think we're putting... the. We're not putting the cart before the horse. We're not redeemed because we believe. We believe because we're already redeemed. We're not reconciled because we believe. We believe because we've been reconciled. In, light, in, same, in the same way, we are not justified, made righteous because we believe. We believe, folks, because we've been justified. John chapter 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. 
99%, give or take, of Christianity today preaches they preach, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me will get, as a result of that belief, everlasting life. Folks, it doesn't say that. It is as clear as English can be English. It says that the one that hears and believes does so because he already has everlasting life. And the verse clinches that as it closes. He shall not come into condemnation because, that's a perfect passive, he has already, in past time, passed from death to life. That's what the grammar says. Dearly beloved, we were born again by the will of God. I don't know how many preachers today are preaching the, the, the truth of the gospel. I don't know. But I would stake my life on the fact that they are so few, they're hard to find. This ministry will always remain faithful as much as possible to the truth of God's Word despite all any and all opposition or affliction. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Have a blessed day. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.